हेलो लिंक पे तो चालू नहीं हुआ है तो मैं जब आज दम आ रहा हूँ तो नहीं आ रहा चलो देखता हूँ या ओके हाय एवरीवन हाय सॉरी आई थॉट द लाइव हैज नॉट येट स्टार्टेड हाउ आर यू ऑल डूइंग हाउ इज एवरीवन डूइंग परफेक्ट so now revti now you might be hearing my audio because now it is available earlier i was not speaking only low volume okay now is it better now is it better now better is the volume still low is the volume still low or is it okay is it okay all right so i welcome you all to this uh, amazing session called as dams med school and uh, we are doing the gen z thing uh, <clears throat> by naming it med school with a cool in it and uh, this is something that is a very good initiative especially because uh of the way we are approaching a topic uh in this session and i was thinking a lot about what should be included in this topic and uh, you know uh, what is that i want to teach you all in a matter of an hour and then i was first thinking of related to something related to anesthesia maybe a part of machine or how we choose a drug uh but then i uh, thought ki why not to give you something that is very important from the perspective of your exams but we don't really get a very good clinical picture out of it because we are not too much associated with patients in mbbs especially in critical care units but yes when our when we are in casualty we see this thing very often and uh, i feel that if i give you a clinical picture of uh, how to approach a patient who needs oxygen therapy who needs oxygen therapy then it would become very good for you so now this time i am doing it little different uh what i am wanting to do is i am trying to give you a clinical picture first and then we are going to see sequentially how we give oxygen therapy to a patient uh, who is critically ill right so i welcome you all to this med school session i think everybody who is wanting to join live has joined uh, all of you can just give me a thumbs up so i know uh, that i am with you and you are with me and we can start with the case case discussion and let's read the case that is in front of us mr sonu lal is a 58 year old male uh, with a history of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease copd presents to the emergency department with worsening shortness of breath productive cough and fever for past 3 days he is a former smoker with a 30 pack years of smoking uh, and on history on examination he is tachypneic with accessory muscle use and his oxygen saturation is 85% on room air now this is i have framed this as a clinical aspect of the case that is in front of you and i want you all to think about this case very very uh, diligently because this is a very common case that you will get when you will be working as an intern in a casualty or if you are doing a duty as a cmo or you are in a icu you are a duty doctor is an icu or a jr in an icu and this is a very uh, simple case that we discuss okay very simple case that we discuss that we come across so a patient who is a known case of copd and presents to emergency with shortness of breath productive cough and fever from past 3 days he is a former smoker with 30 pack years of smoking so first tell me your diagnosis first tell me your diagnosis and then we will move on to examination and confirming that diagnosis and then we will think of management just like how you take a case in your ward a general medicine case for your final exam 
this is exactly how you approach your patients clinically as well right there's no difference so tell me what is your diagnosis here yes the diagnosis is acute exacerbation of copd very good the diagnosis is acute exacerbation of copd is it something that we see very often yes we see it very often a patient who is a known case of copd he might get acute exacerbations it can be because of n number of reasons the most common is infection most common is infection so you can see there are certain signs of infection like productive cough and fever from past 3 days right so you have made a tentative diagnosis called as acute exacerbation of copd now let's go to examination and confirm it so there is an exacerbation of copd so it gives a type 2 respiratory picture where you will have tachypnea accessory muscle use and low saturation what does this point towards this information points towards what when you look at tachypneic patient tachypneic means more than normal respiratory rate we consider 12 to 16 breaths per minute as a normal respiratory rate so if a person is breathing more than normal respiratory rate with accessory muscle of respiration and still you are getting a low saturation then what is happening with the patient what is the patient showing you say i'm going very slow i want you to start thinking the moment you get a question like this you have to start thinking about what is happening with the patient why do we feel that clinical questions are difficult is because we are more concerned about the answers and less concerned about how we are approaching the patient see first you have to know what the patient is having and then only you can think of treating the patient right very good the patient is showing signs of respiratory distress i am very happy with you all respiratory distress isn't it respiratory distress with low saturation respiratory distress with low saturation isn't it so you have an acute exacerbation of copd with patient showing respiratory distress and low saturation so now you tell me what would be your steps in the management we are going to discuss everything but let's just first know what we already know and then we will try and change whatever is wrong with our thinking try to understand what i am saying first let's see what what is that we want to do in this case you have the diagnosis i want you to write down your steps in the management your steps in the management how would you manage so imagine that you are in a casualty it is 2 am in the night you are pretty tired your medicine resident just told you okay i am now going to sleep because i have a long day tomorrow i have to do all the admissions and then i have to go for rounds and then investigations after the rounds and then informing in the evening so he said okay i am going you manage and don't call me and you get a patient who whom do you get sonulal so what will you do steps in the management don't write niv 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 is that what you see this patient as a patient presenting to casualty 2 am low saturation breathing tachypneic accessory muscle of respiration you will start an iv no left right center nothing very good vivan very good very good first is to stabilize the patient always stabilize the patient look at the a b c's of the patient a b c which is airway breathing circulation very good first is to stabilize the patient very good very good then vitals i am very happy now you are thinking more like what you are going to do you will look at vitals that would include pulse blood pressure respiratory rate spo2 peripheries pallor sinuses icterus very good 
okay you said vitals and chest x-ray now i would not at that point of time think of investigating the patient first i have to stabilize the patient i have to treat the patient as come with respiratory distress then think of sending the patient to an x-ray unit for chest x-ray that is to confirm your diagnosis you have already made a uh, tentative diagnosis of uh, acute exacerbation of copd with respiratory distress yes now you will start with oxygen therapy why because the impending need is to supplement the oxygen because the patient is hypoxic so the immediate need is to supplement oxygen to the patient very good very good very good perfect after you give oxygen therapy then you will treat the condition treatment of copd and we will do it basic nebulization to relieve the bronchospasm antibiotics to relieve the antibiotics to relieve the infection and bronchodilator steroids again these are parenteral steroids very good and then once you have stabilized the patient then you will think of investigations now tell me which investigation would be your first choice here chest x-ray for that you have to send the patient to a chest x-ray to a radiology department or something else which investigation would be the first thing that you are going to do first thing that you are going to do yes you are going to first do a abg which is arterial blood gas arterial blood gas very good and then you will send for routine blood investigations in this case you would want to look at a cbc to rule out any cause of infection you would want to look at chest x-ray which is usually pa view to look the extent of lung involvement or severity of the disease extent of lung involvement and severity of the disease all right and then last would be re-evaluate in few hours stabilize analyze oxygen therapy treatment investigation and reevaluate in few hours isn't it are you all okay with this plan of action are you all okay with this plan of action yes now of this plan of action now you have to understand this is the entire management of a patient who has come to you with an acute exacerbation of copd entire management see your idea as a critical care specialist is not to only look at one thing the problem with which the patient has come you want that the patient has come with a problem i want to discharge this patient home on his foot walking so always remember the entire management is very very important okay okay of this today we are going to discuss this oxygen therapy of all the management we are going to discuss oxygen therapy now i will ask you a simple question is oxygen supplementation in an acute exacerbation of copd the only treatment that you are going to do is giving oxygen to a patient who is hypoxic is the only treatment is giving oxygen to a patient who is hypoxic the only treatment that you want to do is it the only treatment that you want to do no oxygen therapy is a part of the entire treatment protocol that you are doing it's a part and it's an important part both from what we are doing with the patient and what is being asked in the exam so let's discuss oxygen therapy. so what would be the steps in the management diagnose then 
stabilize then monitor vitals then start oxygen therapy then treat the condition then investigate and then re-evaluate let's start with oxygen therapy but before we want to look at the oxygen therapy don't you think we need to know what is normal unless and until you know what is normal how can you look at a patient and say okay this looks abnormal so i need to do something so i'm just going to give you a brief overview of what is normal what is normal normal physiology of a person so what you are is what normal is so you can just look at yourself conscious oriented to time place person alert and cooperative vital signs normal say pulse between 60 to 100 nibp 120 to 80 respiratory rate 12 to 16 with using diaphragm as the main muscle of respiration and oxygen saturation between 94 to 100 percent 94 to 100 percent 94 to 100 percent this is normal but this is normal clinically let's talk about normal biochemically biochemically so biochemically is on arterial blood gas abg so if i take your abg sample and send it for gas analysis what will i find ph normal 7.35 to 4.5 po2 normal 75 to 100 PCO2 normal 35 to 45 mmHg and bicarb normal is 22 to 26 milli equivalents per liter. This is normal. Now why am I telling you this normal thing? Because you can have different types of abnormality in a patient, isn't it? You can have a normal physiology but an abnormal biochemistry. You can have an abnormal biochemistry but normal physiology but you have to treat the entire patient you can't think i will only treat one you have to treat both and at the same time you have to make sure that while you are treating one you always keep a check on another how we'll see now okay so let's start with signs of respiratory failure. Now we will look at something that is abnormal. Now here because we are talking about specifically oxygen therapy in a critically ill, we are only going to focus on what are the signs of respiratory failure. So this is not something that you don't know. I am just writing it down so that you find these words in your question. In the exam, you find these words. When you find these words, it gives you the correct diagnosis that there is a respiratory failure. What are the things? Accessory muscle use. When the diaphragm is getting tired, your work of breathing is so high that you need more muscle to now do effective breathing. That is use of accessory muscles of respiration. Altered mental status. That is usually because of hypoxia or hypercapnia. Kachik. Cathetic, the patient looks very tense, cathetic. Conversational dyspnea, very, very common. The patient will come to you, Dr. Sahab, This is conversational dyspnea, diaphoretic, very, very common. Patient is profusely setting, no matter the temperature outsides are very cold, fever respiratory distress at rest or exertion obesity purse clip breathing what is a purse clip breathing this is purse clip breathing this is very specifically seen in cases of copd chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders because this gives a natural peep to the patient that tends to keep the alveoli open you look at the neck, jugular, venous distension, lymphadenopathy, tracheal deviation. And if you look at chest and thorax, asymmetrical chest expansion, decreased breath sounds, paradoxical breathing, pectus carinatum, pectus excavatum, pleural rub, reduced chest expansion and all types of adventitious sounds like ronchi, strider, tachypnea, wheeze. Isn't it? Isn't this something that you know, commonly know that you are going to see? Isn't it something that you are, you, you know that you are going to see these things, isn't it? 
you already know that you are going to see these things. I am just writing it down. So one is to know the normal. Another is to know the abnormal. Only when you know the normal, you can identify the abnormal. Isn't it? Only when you know the normal, you can identify the abnormal. <coughs> so let's start with the initial management of this patient. So upon admission, the first thing that you're going to do is start supplemental oxygen therapy via nasal cannula at 4 liters per minute to maintain saturation above 90 or Venturi mask as he is a case of COPD. So we'll look at oxygen delivery devices. So when I say oxygen delivery devices, these are usually all the non-invasive oxygen delivery devices. Now there are different types of non-invasive oxygen delivery devices. We can classify them into certain categories like the type of the device based on their flow rate into low flow systems and high flow systems. What is a low flow system? A low flow system is where the flow rate of oxygen that is going to the patient is less than 15 liters per minute. And this is the most common oxygen therapy that you are going to use, which includes nasal cannula, Hudson's face mask and non rebreathing mask. Nasal cannula, normal low flow nasal cannula, Hudson's face mask, the O2 mask that you commonly use and non rebreathing mask. Then you have high flow systems, which are more than 15 liters per minute, which includes Venturi mask, high flow nasal cannula and CPAP or BiPAP. We are going to discuss all of them. Now this low flow and high flow has been asked in the exam. Which of the following is a low flow delivery system, high flow delivery system. So remember it is the flow rate of oxygen that is going to the patient, to the patient. If it is more than 15 liters per minute, it is high flow. If it is less than 15 liters per minute, then it is low flow. All right. Dr. Khan, I would request you to focus on the topic that I am trying to tell here rather than what I am not, not teaching you today, right? Gold criteria, management of COPD, that is not the topic of discussion. The topic of discussion is very specific. What is the oxygen delivery to a critically ill patient? So approach to a critically ill patient who is needing oxygen therapy, right? So we are going to stick to that, all right? Now I am going to show the images and certain salient features nasal cannula is the simplest which uses the nasal uh, nasopharyngeal dead space as a source of oxygen usually the flow rates is between 1 to 5 or 6 liters per minute FiO2 between 0.23 to 0.35 face mask also called as Hudson's mask which is used between 5 to 10 liters per minute FiO2 between 30 to 50 percent you have face mask with reservoir back called as NRBM, non rebreathing mask, non rebreathing mask, which is between 10 to 15 liters per minute. And this gives highest FiO2 in O2 delivery devices. So if somebody asks you highest FiO2 in oxygen delivery devices, remember it is always between these four. Because rest of the devices, you can control FiO2. If you can control FiO2, highest FiO2 is always 100%. So you don't talk about other devices that is non-invasive ventilation using CPAP, BiPAP or uh, HF, HFNC that is high flow nasal cannula here. When somebody is asking you which O2 delivery device delivers highest FiO2, it is when the FiO2 is variable, which can change. So then the answer would be NRBM. And then you have a very specific mask called as Venturi face mask. How do you identify? You will see a long uh, tube and at the end of it, there is a valve which have different colors, blue, white, orange, yellow. Okay. Now there is something unique about Venturi mask. Yes. NRBM and rebreathing mask are the same thing. Face mask with reservoir bag is the same as non rebreathing bag, non rebreathing mask. Okay, they are the same thing. All right. Now, what is so unique about Venturi as a mask 
is that it's a only a fixed O2 delivery device. It is a fixed oxygen delivery device. That means it delivers constant FiO2 irrespective of the respiratory pattern of the patient. It delivers a constant FiO2. It delivers a constant FiO2. It remains the same. It not necessarily be too high. So therefore, if the question is asked, which of the following delivers maximum FiO2, the answer will not be Venturi because NRBM can deliver up to 85% theoretically up to 100% oxygen. Venturi can never deliver more than 65%. But whatever valve you use at a particular flow rate, whatever is the designated FiO2, the patient will always get that FiO2. That is the difference between a fixed and a variable O2 delivery device. Then you have high flow nasal cannula HFNC, which is a proper ventilator type of device that has a flow rates up to 60 liters per minute and you can control the FiO2. And then you have non-invasive ventilation in the form of BiPAP or CPAP mask, which again have very high flow rates and you can control the variable, you can control the FiO2. So this is the first part of the discussion that is on the O2 delivery device. Now we'll do discuss something about high flow nasal cannula. Now this is a very unique device. This is a ventilator type of device. When I say ventilator type of device, then this is for your understanding in an image based question. In an image based question. Okay. It will look something like this. It's a proper machine. The machine has calibrated flow meters. It has a nasal cannula. There is a system for heating and humidification. So prima facie, it looks like a ventilator without a screen. In a ventilator, there is normally a big screen on which you can set all the parameters. So you don't see a screen in an HFNC, but it prima facie looks like a ventilator. All right. Now, what is so important is that it delivers high flow. That is, that is what I told you more than 15 liters per minute fixed performance. That means whatever FiO2 you have said, the patient will get that heated and humidified oxygen delivery device, heated and humidified, heated to body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius, humidified to 99% humidification. What is the advantage? Easy to use in some patients, minimal risk of gastric distension and can deliver high FiO2s with some PEEP. Good humidification helps in mucociliary clearance and can help avoid intubation. So if a patient is not having exact contraindication to NIV or non-invasive ventilation, the patient is still able to hold their secretions, have a normal mental status, then use of HFNC sometimes can avoid intubation in such patients. But this is also a disadvantage because there is a potential to delay intubation. That means there is a possibility that you might become enthusiastic. You might think, okay, aayega, aayega, patient upar aayega, and then you might actually keep on, uh, keep on keeping the patient on HFNC for a little longer than normal time leading to some complications associated with hypoxia. So the potential to delay intubation is also a disadvantage. It requires heating and humidification. So it requires power really very expensive and it has to need an intermediate pressure source of oxygen and not like what you can very easily deliver through a non-invasive O2 delivery device. Yes. See, HFNC has recently been started to use for adults, but otherwise it has been used in neonates from a very long time and it is very effective because they have premature babies have a lot of surfactant problem, right? They have lot of surfactant problem. What do you call them? The acute respiratory, uh, sorry, the pediatric respiratory, RDS, a respiratory distress syndrome. That is because of prematurity, the surfactant is not there. And in those patients, they use lot of HFNC and the patients have very good outcome. They use FHNC, HFNC and then they give surfactant in it. And then it, uh, uh, they, so use of HFNC is very, very good in uh, pediatric patients, but in adults, we are still exploring that option. Okay. All right, London, uh, your uh, feedback has been taken and we'll try to work uh, towards it. 
but uh, if you can then just focus on what we are discussing here so that at least in this session you get the best of it hai na so try to be a swan try to only pick what you want and you can reject rest of the things if you feel there is something not good enough you can't just sit and fixate on it you can probably try and get over it by fixating on something that you that you need all right so if you can focus on this uh, particular uh, session then it would be very helpful for you all right now what happened you started the patient on oxygen therapy and later on when you did an abg it re revealed respiratory acidosis with partial pressures of oxygen 55 and co2 70 with a ph of 7.28 He is diagnosed with acute exacerbation of COPD. Started on bronchodilator, corticosteroids, and antibiotics. Isn't it? Now the picture looks little more difficult. So simple oxygen therapy is not going to decrease this PCO2. He is he is having type two respiratory failure where he is not able to exhale out the COPD, the excess carbon dioxide, the excess carbon dioxide. So now you need to intervene. so that you increase the minute ventilation for that we use something called as niv so now we'll progress to non invasive ventilation despite initial therapy his respiratory distress worsens his abg shows persistent hypercapnia and worsening hypoxemia he is transitioned to non invasive ventilation with bipap which is bi level airway positive airway pressure to improve his respiratory mechanics and gas exchange initially he tolerates niv well and shows improvement in oxygenation and ventilation initially he tolerates it well and shows improvement in oxygenation and ventilation so now we'll discuss niv now niv looks like this have you guys seen this have you have you seen somebody if you go to any icu in india you will find at least one patient on niv the patient is already hyperventilating madhuri and you can't hyperventilate somebody na he is a conscious person you can't tell them wo to already tachypneic hai na so how will you hyperventilate only hyperventilation is not the solution this is how this is a niv interface non invasive ventilation niv interface all right now let's talk about indications and contraindications of niv indication most important is acute hypercapnic exacerbation of copd in your exam most of the time you are going to get a question on this acute hypercapnic exacerbation of copd okay acute hypercapnic exacerbation of copd most of the time in the exam you are going to get this particular clinical scenario the one that we discuss you can also use niv in acute respiratory failure and reduction of respiratory workload in obesity so yes you are right you have seen it in osa patients you might see it used in acute respiratory failure where there is a transient decrease and you might actually not need intubation and of course acute hypercapnic exacerbation of copd what are the contraindications of course apnea because niv is a spontaneous mode of ventilation unable to handle secretions that means when there is a risk of when there is a risk of aspiration facial trauma because blood can get aspirated and claustrophobia because this mask is completely covering the face so if your patient is claustrophobic then you might not be able to use the niv interface theek hai so these are indications and contraindications of niv now we use three types of niv cpap bipap and psv and what does this tell us today a very important lesson patience right i am yet to introduce the topic of niv and you have already started to ask see sir what is the difference between cpap bipap somebody started to answer what we need in life right now is three things we need the pdfs of living your life the pdfs are patience discipline and faith if you can imbibe these three things in your life you are going to be very very successful patience the things that you want are going to come to you not necessarily at the time when you want them to come but when you are meant to get them discipline will beat talent every single day you have to get up you have to sit 
you have to slog that number of hours and then eventually you will get the outcome so discipline and faith very very important these days we really don't have faith in anything that we are doing so we need to have lot of faith you have to trust the process you have to trust that what you are reading is what is going to help you you have to trust that hard work translates to success you have to trust that the person in front of you if he is saying something and if you trust that person and imbibe that knowledge it is going to help you there is no greater glory than getting what you want and what you want is a seat you don't want to judge me you don't want to judge your surroundings you don't want to judge those relatives that are thinking why are you sitting for so long and studying all you want is a seat and you can only get seat when you follow a pdf in your life all right so coming back to the topic spontaneous breathing at positive end expiratory pressure it is peep in a non intubated person is called as cpap so remember peep is equal to cpap in non intubated person so there is a constant positive pressure that is both in inspiratory and expiratory cycle that is called as a cpap alternative to that is called as bipap which is called as bi level positive airway pressure where we keep two pressures ipap which is the inspiratory positive airway pressure and epap which is expiratory so now what happens is just imagine what is the positive airway pressure there is a gush of air that is constantly coming so when you are exhaling that gush of air gives a positive end expiratory pressure that keeps your alveoli open but imagine how difficult it must be for the patient to constantly breathe through a gush of air so to counter that what we do is we need a higher pressure during inspiration to inflate the alveoli but during expiration we require only just the pressure to keep alveoli open so ipap is higher epap is lower and there is one mode that we very commonly use to wean the patient of ventilator is pressure support ventilation this is the only mode of niv that helps in weaning the patient of the of the ventilator as well as it increases the tidal volume why because it is supporting the pressure to achieve the required tidal volume supporting the pressure to uh, achieve required tidal volume theek okay? hai so these are the three modes what what we commonly start in acute exacerbation of copd bipap i am very good madhuri very very good <laughs> see such a small thing cpap is peep in non intubated person cpap is peep in non intubated person okay cpap is peep in non intubated person or a spontaneously breathing patient now we will finally go to the transition of invasive ventilation transition of invasive ventilation now what has happened over the next 24 hours is respiratory status deteriorates further despite niv with increased work of breathing and worsening avg parameters so we are going step by step he has now developed signs of respiratory fatigue with altered mental status is a very very important point if the person has an altered mental status it automatically becomes an indication for invasive mechanical ventilation given his clinical deterioration he is intubated and placed in a invasive mechanical ventilation initial ventilator settings include assist control mode with low tidal volume strategy to minimize barotrauma and volute trauma this is very very specific to ARDS or acute exacerbation of COPD right so now finally your patient has landed up with niv sorry iv invasive mechanical ventilation so let's see what are the contraindications of niv which automatically becomes the indications of invasive ventilation suppose somebody has a immediate threat to life so respiratory failure where there is no the saturation has become 60 the patient has non recordable saturation so that is the immediate threat to life circulatory shock non recordable blood pressure not alert or easily aroused uncontrolled cough or copious secretions facial trauma that prevent use of tight fitting face mask hematemesis or recurrent vomiting 
and uncontrolled seizures. So are you trying to understand if you get these things in a patient, you automatically know that you have to intubate. Would you be in a state to put an NIV or even a non-invasive uh, O2 delivery device in, in these patients? Will you be able to do it? Tell me, will you be able to do it? Of course, no. So when you don't have an option of keeping the patient alert, active, cooperative, awake, then you sedate the patient and you ventilate, you intubate the patient and you put them on invasive mechanical ventilation. Okay. So let's talk about invasive mechanical ventilation. Now invasive mechanical ventilation in itself is a huge topic, isn't it? We have an entire department of critical care that is dedicated to invasive mechanical ventilation. So will it be possible for us to know everything about invasive mechanical ventilation in 10 minutes? No, but whatever we need to know, we are going to discuss and we divide invasive mechanical ventilation into the ways in which we discuss. So any mode of ventilation that is used with an invasive airway and there are only two invasive airways, endotracheal tube and tracheostomy tube. See, we are talking about critically ill patients who are in ICUs, isn't it? So we will never talk about supraglottic airway device. Remember, supraglottic airway devices are used by anesthetist in the OT in elective cases where the patient is already fasted, where the patient is already fasted. So we will not talk about supraglottic airway devices. All right. We will discuss it in terms of the mode of ventilation that we use, algorithm, initial ventilator setting and finally weaning the patient off ventilator step by step. Let's start with mode of ventilation. Now there are hundreds of modes. Every mode has a specific feature. It has four cardinal uh, checkpoints that you need to uh, be aware in a mode. But all of that information is not relevant for us. Why is it not relevant for us? Because at this level, all we are going to get is a question whether it is a control mode or it's a weaning mode. This is what we are going to get. So we can't expect to cover everything. Also, that level of information is never going to help you. It is only going to confuse you. And that is why you see that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of videos on YouTube. What people describing only modes of mechanical ventilation, because that is one of the most confusing topic. There is no common terminology and every company has made their own mode. Every mode has some or the other feature. So we will discuss what is relevant for us. Control mode is where ventilator controls all the aspects of the breath and weaning mode is where the patient is allowed to breathe spontaneously. Patient is allowed to breathe spontaneously. So any mode where you see the word control is a control mode of ventilation. So you have to see the word control. It can be controlled mechanical ventilation or assist control. In assist control, initiation of the breath is by the ventilator, by the patient. But ultimately all the characteristics of the breath are by the ventilator. Synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation is a very common mode of weaning that we use. But the best mode of weaning is pressure support ventilation. Best mode of weaning is pressure support ventilation. Okay. I don't think there will be any confusion after this, isn't it? Either it's a control mode or it's a weaning mode. If you see the word control, that is a control mode. If you don't see the word control, that means it's a weaning mode. As simple as that. As simple as that. Okay. As simple as that. Let's talk about the algorithm of mechanical ventilation. Now, this is not an algorithm per se. It is an algorithm for us to know what to use when and what I have already taught you. I'm just making you write it again. Algorithm in a patient needing oxygen therapy. Would always start with. O2 delivery devices then non-invasive ventilation then invasive mechanical ventilation then 
then weaning then again o2 delivery devices for some time when you wean the patient off then you again put the patient on o2 delivery devices okay ठीक है नाउ विवान देर आर टू एस्पेक्ट ऑफ द क्वेश्चन दैट यू आर आस्ट फर्स्ट एस्पेक्ट इज नो बडी इज गोइंग टू आस्क यू अ क्वेश्चन लाइक दिस इज अ प्रॉपर मैकेनिकल वेंटिलेशन क्वेश्चन विच इज अ पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट लेवल क्वेश्चन सेकेंड इज यू हैव ऑल द मोड्स इन फ्रंट ऑफ यू विच वी हैव ऑलरेडी डिस्कस्ड बेसिक वी हैव डिस्कस्ड वॉट डू यू थिंक वॉट मोड इज दिस वॉट मोड आर यू यूजिंग वेर द पेशेंट इनिशिएट्स ऑल द ब्रेथ्स ईच ब्रेथ इज असिस्टेड बाय अ फिक्सड प्रेशर and patient determines the rate of respiration what do you think will it be controlled mechanical ventilation assist control ventilation synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation or pressure support ventilation although this is beyond the scope but i am still going to discuss it for a minute patient is initiating all the breaths If the patient is initiating all the breaths, then is it a control mode or a weaning mode? So of course a weaning mode, and you are only supporting a pressure to achieve a tidal volume. Only supporting a pressure to achieve tidal volume. Does it sound ring a bell? Only supporting the pressure. to achieve tidal volume what does this mode called as pressure support ventilation jo aapne likha hai wahi to hai pre set pressure you have set and the patient is only supporting the the tidal volume is getting supported by the ventilator giving the breath okay let's come to initial ventilator settings there was one question that was asked on initial ventilator settings in a case of a polytrauma with lot of ribs that were fractured and therefore it prompted us to discuss this question initially you will always start with a assist control mode why because that particular reason why you are mechanically ventilating the patient usually make sure that the patient becomes apneic or you give the drugs that makes the patient apneic okay so you start with assist control mode tidal volume respiratory rate you do it as a combination of minute ventilation so your target is always pco2 because your pco2 is dependent on your minute ventilation so tidal volume is usually between 6 to 8 ml per kg which can go up to 10 but just remember 6 to 8 low tidal volume strategies that is used in uh, ards or respiratory rate 12 to 16 basically target PCO2 should be normal 35 to 45 per minute. So if you are using larger tidal volumes, the respiratory rate will decrease. If you are using lesser tidal volumes to maintain normal PCO2, respiratory rate will increase. FiO2 always start with 100 percent oxygen and then taper to maintain. SpO2 saturation above ninety four percent above ninety four percent okay because at ninety four percent saturation your PCO2 is above sixty mm Hg and that is what comes out of the range of hypoxia. Peep always start with five. and inspiratory flow rate between 60 to 80 liter per minute 60 to 80 liters per minute right so this is your initial ventilator settings initial ventilator settings let's come to weaning now the scenario will change after 3 days of mechanical ventilation okay not dr smith dr sonu lal hai na respiratory status improves with resolution of his acute exacerbation 
His ABG parameters normalize. He shows sign of spontaneous breathing during spontaneous breathing trials. Ventilator is gradually decreased. He is successfully weaned off. Followed by successful spontaneous breathing trial. Patient is extubated and maintained on supplemental oxygen via nasal cannula at 2 liters per minute. He is closely monitored for the signs of respiratory distress and potential need for reintubation. So always after extubation, you put, you give some oxygen to the patient and you always wait for signs of, looking for signs of impending respiratory distress and potential need for reintubation, isn't it? So this is what we wanted to discuss. We started with a patient needing oxygen therapy. We started with looking at the patient clinically, then looking at what is normal, what is abnormal, Start with non-invasive O2 delivery devices, then non-invasive ventilation, then mechanical invasive mechanical ventilation and finally weaning the patient off. Now when you talk about weaning, there are three things that you should know. Best mode of weaning is pressure support ventilation that I have discussed, pressure support ventilation. And the method of weaning is usually by spontaneous breathing trial. That means you leave the patient off the ventilator spontaneously breathing for period of 15 minutes to one hour and then check ABG. This is called a spontaneous breathing trial and this has to be after sedation vacation when you stop giving sedatives. After sedation vacation when you have stopped giving Sedation. This is spontaneous breathing trial. This is the method. And how do you assess the success of your weaning? By something called as RSBI, which is Rapid Shallow Breathing Index. Rapid Shallow Breathing Index, which is the respiratory rate of the patient divided by tidal volume in liters respiratory rate divided by tidal volume in liters so if this is more than 100 it is failure of weaning if it is less than 100 it is success of weaning success of weaning okay very good swati i am very happy you have a very good understanding of this topic right so this is what we have done that is we have weaned the patient of the ventilator. Now this is a basic algorithm. Now yeah, algorithm if you remember it then fine otherwise what we have discussed is more than uh, sufficient. Severe respiratory compromise or impending arrest if yes then you will direct intubate the patient. So it's not like you can't get a patient whom you need direct intubation. Sometimes the pathology is so severe that you get direct intubation. If no then you see whether there is a risk of type 2 respiratory failure. If yes, that means the patient is a case of COPD where CO2 is a problem, then you target a lower saturation 88 to 92 and we know when you want a very specific saturation, you use a very specific device called as Venturi mask, which we use give 24 to 28% oxygen, obtain ABGs, FiO2, uh, if uh, reduce the FiO2, get SpO2 more than 92%, if it is less than uh, the patient is going into respiratory distress, less pH, more PCO2, then you will consider NIV. If everything is okay, then you will continue with lowest possible O2 delivery to maintain a saturation between 88 to 92 percent. But if there is no risk of type 2 respiratory failure, then you can target a little higher uh, SPO2, 94 to 98 percent. Again, if you have more hypoxia, then you will consider nasal cannula or simple face mask. If you have severe hypoxia, then you start O2 mask with reservoir okay but at any point of time if PCO2 becomes more than 45 consider invasive mechanical ventilation just a basic understanding of what we have already discussed now to top it up what we have discussed let's discuss some MCQs let's discuss some MCQs so a 70 year old with a history of COPD presents with increased dyspnea and a respiratory rate of 30 breaths per minute the patient is anxious diaphoretic but alert and responsive he has an auto saturation of 85% on room air. Which non-invasive delivery device should be initiated first? Which non-invasive delivery device should be initiated first? 
what would you give okay very good non rebreathing because it gives 100% fio2 very good so vivan after all of this that we have discussed in the last 56 minutes ultimately you only wanted to give high fio2 hai right? na that is what you wanted high fio2 a patient who is anxious and diaphoretic but alert and responsive which has a saturation of 85 but is a known case of copd he has a high respiratory rate do you really want to give something that will suddenly give lot of oxygen to the patient or you want to precisely control your oxygen to achieve a saturation between 88 to 92% which i just discussed this is what your target is in this patient acute exacerbation of copd you will start with venturi mask or low flow nasal cannula giving 24 28 32 35% oxygen where the patient is breathing the moment the oxygen comes up the patient usually settles because you start the supportive treatment simultaneously so the correct answer to this is venturi mask why no high flow oxygen via nasal cannula it is when your requirements are very high it is in the later stages we discuss na requirements are very high so this is out nrbm because you don't want to give initially so much of oxygen and bipap again you don't directly start with bipap always start with o2 delivery device if you can manage on o2 delivery device you would avoid using bipap okay now soon after starting the oxygen therapy the patient is showing worsening shortness of breath accessory muscle use oxygen saturation of 88 on nrbm so you started with venturi you didn't you were not happy you went to nrbm and even on nrbm it is 88 ABG reveals pH of seven point three, PCO two of sixty, PO two of fifty five. Which intervention is most appropriate for initial respiratory support? Now tell me what has happened. What has happened here? The patient has worsening clinical status as well as worsening biochemical status. Both are worsening, isn't it? Both are worsening. So what will you do? You started oxygen therapy. You started supportive treatment, but the patient still has worsening of the condition. what will you do what will you do at this point of time initiate endotracheal intubation mechanical ventilation high flow oxygen therapy via nasal cannula nebulized bronchodilator systemic corticosteroid or initiate bipap initiate bipap yes here you will use bipap why too much of pco2 bipap is going to help you exhale that co2 out it is not just about oxygen it is also about pco2 and that is why you will why would you again intubate why would you directly intubate worsening shortness of breath hai but why would you intubate is there any contraindication to niv or indication of intubation written here always remember na see ye to main tandem ye to khud banaye hue question hai ye aapne oxygen therapy start ki ऑक्सीजन थेरेपी फेल हो गई अच्छे से काम नहीं कर रही है नेक्स्ट स्टेप वुड ऑलवेज बी टू पुट द पेशेंट ऑन बाईपैप यू वुड नॉट स्टार्ट इनिशिएट एंडोट्रकल इंटोबेशन एंड मैकेनिकल वेंटिलेशन ओके डिस्पाइट बाईपैप द पेशेंट्स रेस्पिरेटरी डिस्ट्रेस वर्सन्स आर्टीरियल ब्लस कैट रिव्यूल्स वर्सनिंग सिवियर हाइपोक्सेमिया हाइपर कैपनिया अलॉन्ग विद डिक्लाइनिंग मेंटल स्टेटस ऑफ द पेशेंट नाउ वॉट विल यू डू now what will you do it's practically feeding you the answers the question is practically feeding you the answers increase pressure support on bipap bronchodilator endotracheal intubation high flow nasal cannula you will perform endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation so try to understand the chronology of symptoms initially the patient just presents to you with high respiratory rate and little hypoxia and say hypercapnia you start oxygen therapy start supportive treatment in the hope that the patient will improve the patient doesn't improve you put them on a bipap continue the treatment the patient still declines there is a declining mental function severe hypoxemia severe respiratory acidosis then you will intubate and mechanically ventilate the patient don't be in a hurry to intubate the patient that is what i want you to remember the whole idea of discussing this topic today was 
whenever a question of acute exacerbation of COPD comes, don't be in a hurry to keep intubating the patient. Don't always think ki, haan, main to intubate karunga. Okay. ठीक है, so don't think कि you will directly just intubate the person. Intubation in a COPD patient should be the last resort because it is very difficult to wean the patient off ventilator if he is COPD. NIV के तीन mode होते हैं साहिल, CPAP, BiPAP, PSV. Most commonly in acute exacerbation of COPD we use BiPAP. तो NIV फेल होगा तो बाईपैप नहीं NIV इज इक्वलेंट टू बाईपैप एंड बाईपैप इज इक्वलेंट टू NIP द पेशेंट इज नाउ ऑन मैकेनिकल वेंटिलेशन ड्यू टू वर्सनिंग रेस्पिरेटरी फेलियर व्हिच वेंटिलेटर सेटिंग मोस्ट कॉमनली यूज्ड टू मिटिगेट डायनेमिक हाइपर इन्फ्लेशन विद COPD सो व्हाट विल यू डू इनिशिएशन ऑफ वेंटिलेशन वॉल्यूम कंट्रोल वेंटिलेशन विद लो टाइडल वॉल्यूम प्रेशर कंट्रोल विद हाई एयरवे प्रेशर प्रेशर कंट्रोल वेंटिलेशन PCV and synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation again straightforward question initial ventilator setting always control so you will always start with controlled mode volume control with low tidal volume strategy of course you don't want high airway pressure the patient already has high airway pressures and after several days on mechanical ventilation the patient shows signs of improvement and is ready to start weaning what is the suitable method to initiate weaning process in a COPD exacerbation, decrease fraction of FiO2, increase PEEP, administer IV corticosteroid and perform spontaneous breathing trials. Perform spontaneous breathing trials. Yes, of course you will perform spontaneous breathing trials. You will keep the patient spontaneously breathing for some time and then you will try and wean the patient off the ventilator. Again, put the patient on some O2 delivery devices using nasal cannula or face mask and then try to completely recover the patient, shift to wards, keep them on no oxygen for few days and then discharge the patient home. All right. So this is an approach to a patient, critically ill patient who requires oxygen therapy. I hope that you have understood the nuances of it you have tried to understand that it is not always mechanical ventilation that you will go with. You will have to go step by step and you have to look at the patient as a whole. So look at the normal, look at the abnormal and based on that make a decision. Don't haste into the decision of intubating the patient. So I hope this topic is now making some sense to you. I thank you all for coming here, being live with us, being very interactive. You can always subscribe our channel DAMS eMedicos and you can hit the bell icon for notifications. These sessions are going to be amazing for you. I have seen the previous sessions by other faculties as well. You can also join the DAMS eMedicos Telegram channel. We put all the updates, we put daily quizzes, we put everything there and you can always contact me. You know my name, I'm Dr. Anshul Divakar and I'll be happy to help you any queries related to critical care or anesthesia or in general uh, about your preparation. And just keep your faith, keep your patience, keep your discipline. Remember the PDF is what is going to uh, make you understand and make you cross this journey as soon as possible. Okay. So just make sure that you do not forget your PDFs. All right. Is if, if there is any doubt, then I'm happy to help you with. Otherwise, it was wonderful meeting you all on this YouTube live. And I hope to see you again soon. Yeah, sure. Definitely. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll keep doing this thing. I think critical care is something that needs little bit of touch. So next topic, maybe I'll do just, you know, details of modes of mechanical ventilation. Okay. Wonderful. So I think there are no doubts. So I hope to see you on the other side and uh, my best wishes to you. Keep working hard and uh, have patience and discipline.